Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello and welcome to the Movie Trap. My name is Russell Carlson and with me as always, my co-host, Chris Borum. Get in the truck. <laughs> and also with me, my other co-host, Zach Power. Uh, the bridge looks fine. <laughs> Perfectly safe. <laughs> um, uh, welcome to the movie trap on the movie trap. Us three hosts uh, pick three movies around a particular theme chosen by another one of our hosts. And then at the end of it, we each get 10 points to vote. And whoever wins that gets to choose the next theme uh, for the three movies. So we are smack dab in the middle of Chris of uh, Zach Powers' theme of movies from high school. Previously, we watched uh, Reservoir Dogs, and now we are watching Chris Boroff's pick, 1977's William Friedkin's The Sorcerer. Not The Sorcerer, just Sorcerer. Um, I, I, I was surprised, Boref, that you picked this movie. I, I, I have to do an immediate mea culpa because on the last Reservoir Dogs, <laughs> I had said that this movie is terrible and then realizing it almost immediately, like, I have not seen this movie. So uh, this was my first time watching it. So apologies. Yeah. Russell thought everybody. it was Wishmaster or some shit. Yeah, yeah I thought um, it was, I, I do think well, it was like some MST3K fucking movie or some shit. Well, you know, there was, was a movie. A... There was a movie called Sword and the Sorcerer that was that known... It was primarily the movie where on the cover it looks like it's going to be way more badass than it is because it's a guy with three swords right. fighting like a big demon dude. And then when you watch sure. it, the guy loses two of those blades immediately. So he's just a guy with a sword for the rest of the movie and the demon monster uh, never shows up. It's That's not in the movie. Right. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a classic yeah. tactic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is not this movie, which is calling the movie Sorcerer thinking it's going to be one thing. <laughs> it's very much not. Um, so, Zach, why don't we uh, pull behind the curtain and uh, see the box filled uh, with nitroglycerin and sand and uh, get rolling down the rocky, rocky path. Okay. Sorcerer is a 1977 film directed by William Friedkin. It stars Roy Schneider, Bruno Kremer, Francisco Rabal, and Amadou. Um, no surname on that. Uh, it is an adaptation of the 1950 French novel Le Salier de la Pure, um, aka Wages of Fear. Uh, the second adaptation of that novel after the French film uh, from 1953. Um, so ostensibly, this movie opens, it, it kind of operates in segments. Uh, and the first segment is, uh, that takes up probably about 30 to 40 minutes, is a look at who these characters who we're going to spend this movie with are. Um, and that is done through a series of uh, quick, I guess, vignettes into their, their lives. Um, first, we meet uh, Nilo, who is um, a South American assassin. Uh, he is shown shooting somebody in, uh, I think, an unspecified, or unspecified. Uh, no, they say it's in like Villa de la Cruz in Mexico. Oh, whatever. okay. They, they have in a Mexico. little placard that comes up. Yeah, uh, I mean, he is shown executing uh, some businessman in Mexico and casually walking out into a crowd in the shortest of the vignettes. Um, after that, we uh, meet our second uh, uh, protagonist, Kasem who is a Palestinian uh, militant uh, who is seen organizing a bombing in Jerusalem with a small group of, uh, of accomplices. Uh, after the bombing, they attempt to escape, um, but one of them is killed, another is arrested, and Qasem becomes the only person uh, to, to escape this, uh, this terrorist attack. Um, finally, uh, the third one we meet is uh, a Frenchman named Victor Mazon, uh, who lives in France uh, in an upscale lifestyle, um, deeply in love with his wife, uh, as we see. Um, they're celebrating an anniversary, but he is called into his office where it is discovered he and his brother are being investigated for some kind of financial fraud, and they're in dire straits. Uh, they need money right away to make this problem go away without them being sent to jail. Um, uh, Victor uh, compels his brother to ask their wealthy father 
to lend them the money so that they will not immediately be sent to prison. Um, but later that night at, uh, at his anniversary dinner, Victor's brother shows up and says, the father has rejected it outright. He thinks this whole deal will ruin the family. Victor says, go back to him one more time. But his brother walks to the car and blows his brains out. And Victor, realizing he is out of options, just begins to run for it. Um, and then the final uh, of our protagonists uh, is a uh, is a, a stick-up man named Jackie, who is shown robbing um, a mob-connected church with a number of accomplishment, uh, accomplices. Uh, it's very Reservoir Dogs, in fact. It's an appropriate sort of uh, continuation. Um, during the robbery, a priest is shot uh, and the four accomplices begin to drive away. There's an argument over whether it was necessary to shoot the priest. That causes a car crash. Um, all of the uh, other accomplices are either killed by the crash or the police. And uh, Jackie manages to survive. But the priest was uh, the brother of an extremely connected mafioso. And so now there is, uh, there is a hit out on Jackie. And he has no choice but to flee the country. Um for somewhere else. And that somewhere else is a place called Porvin the Year, um, where all three of these men uh, who are on the run, the terrorist, the financial, um, you know, the criminal, and Jackie uh, all end up living in abject, abject poverty, taking odd jobs where they can. Uh, there's, a, there's a pipeline in the area and an oil rig kind of nearby that they sometimes work on but they basically do whatever they can to survive. Um, uh, along with um, a, uh, a fellow uh, guy who, who's, who's on the run, a man named Marquis, implied to be a former Nazi. Um, eventually, Nilo uh, shows up via private plane for reasons not entirely known. Um, and uh, it is not long after that an oil barracks uh, run by a uh, wealthy uh, U.S. company explodes and there is a uh, fire going. Uh, the oil, you know, sh as it shoots up, continues to burn. The only way to extinguish the flame is with dynamite. But unfortunately, the dynamite has two problems. It's kind of far away and it has been poorly stored. So now it is deeply unstable and too much jostling will blow it up because it is functionally nitroglycerin. So what are you to do except for ask for a number of drivers who will drive shitty rickety trucks, like 200 or something miles to get this nitroglycerin where it needs to go to stop this oil fire. And eventually they settle on uh, our three runaways and the Nazi, um, but the Nazi is, mysteriously killed um and nilo takes his place putting the four men on a perilous journey uh through the jungle the south american jungle um so over the course uh, of this journey this uh um uh, you know uh, the trials the second x trials they have to endure uh <laughs> They, aside from just normal, shitty, unpaved roads and a terrible, awful couple of trucks that are falling apart and barely work, um, they have to cross bridges in thunderous rainstorms that uh, are so low they, they descend into the water while debris is coming down, um, you know, uh, and they have to wench their way out of the bridge, like, to pull the truck out because they simply are too submerged to even drive at a certain point. Uh, you know, deep, deep, deep Road. trenches on mm -hmm. the edge of the roads sure. that are narrow and thin. Um, sure. Trees. A tree has around, fallen over uh, and around blocked their mountains. path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around mountains. Yeah. A tree falls over and blocks their path at one point, And it seems impossible to uh, navigate around because it's surrounded by yeah. swamp. It's a regular but... four-wheel Fitzcarraldo. Yeah, Kassem <laughs> does uh, rig a mechanism uh, to use a little bit of the nitroglycerin to clear the tree by essentially blowing it up uh, from a safe distance using like a jury-rigged sort of time 
like a sandbag that drops a rock on the nitroglycerin once they get far away enough to be safe. Very um, MacGyver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ultimately, though, uh, uh, Kassam and Victor in the uh, truck uh, up ahead, seeming like they've just about made it to the encampment, uh, suffer a very sudden tire blowout that careens them off the road and the nitroglycerin in their truck explodes, killing them both. Uh, leaving um, Nilo and Jackie. Uh, but they are uh, they run afoul of a group of bandits uh, who are looking to steal whatever is in their truck. Now, Nilo being a cold-blooded assassin uh, and Jackie being a gangster, they do manage to kill the uh, trio of bandits, but Nilo is fatally injured in the process and dies shortly thereafter, uh, along, unfortunately, with the truck, meaning Jackie has to walk the nitroglycerin the last little bit of the way into the, uh, into the city where he is kind of hailed as like, he, he's kind of hailed as a hero. Almost. They imply that like a, a private plane will wait for him because of what he's done to stop this, uh, oil fire. Um, and, uh, it seems like things might be looking up. Maybe he can escape this life of poverty and have some semblance of normality now. Um, but he's, still getting over this insane trial um, psychologically. Uh, he takes the time to dance with a uh, poor maid of the village who's scrubbing the floors. And it's shown that some of the gangsters from his old life show up and walk into the bar, implying Jackie's fate may not be so grand. And that is the conclusion of the film. There's also a gunshot. Oh, okay. In the soundtrack. It's it's a little quiet because yeah. there's so many other things yeah. happening, but they put it in there almost as like a, an afterthought. Oh, sure. Okay. It's, you know, it's the equivalent of Mr. Pink. Um, right. Did he make it? Did he not? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that is the movie of Sorcerer. Um, it, it, it should be noted that it was also written by Waylon Green. Gentlemen, we remember Waylon Green from the film Wild Bunch. And there are a lot of similar themes, I think, in this film. Uh, sure, that makes sense. In the sort of yeah. rugged, sort of masculine, you know, sort of Ernest Hemingway sort of thing. Um, and that it's makes also, a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. It, it, and it makes a lot of sense even in the sort of non-dialogue dialogue that goes on, you know, because this uh, film, I, 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 you know, uh, like, it, it, I, it's, I, it's I very up, sparse. I looked up Waylon Green on the page just to see uh, what else he did. And there's a few other less famous movies, including RoboCop 2. But um, he is notable also for allowing a millipede to crawl over his face for the tunnel scene in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So that's Waylon Green, writer of The Wild Bunch and Sorcerer, if you ever watch that scene wow. again. Yeah. Wow. Uh, totally. And, and by the way, Friedkin does nothing but sing his praises he says waylon green was the smartest guy I ever knew you know like and hey. and part of part of dude uh, he's still alive living out in baltimore yep, so for sure well um, I mean, here's a here's a question i you had when we were watching this you had talked about maybe going back and trying to watch the original did you end up doing never that? got a chance to i, I wish i could okay. have but and I, it's yeah. unfortunately the original is quite long i considered it yeah. too and i looked at the runtime and it's like over two and a half hours and i'm like yeah i don't know if i'm gonna yeah. find time for that uh, yeah, I tried yeah. watching the first chunk of it um, for this, but I didn't actually wind up finishing it. However, I have seen it at one point, and it's interesting you mentioned the writer, because I will say that, like, comparing the two, um, this writer did a lot more work to set up the backstory for the characters before they got to the action point. Um, the original didn't really set a backstory. It just, like, here's your characters. And then it started building the world around them as they were going through meeting each other, because the... Uh, Francesco Rabal character uh, shows up in the original one, but he's just a fancy man who shows up who has a lot of money, and then they wind up going and having the adventure. Um, hmm. yeah. This one, it's I, I funny think though. I thought more of it was like going to be can... in the truck, from what I remembered, because it was just sure. the midpoint is when it actually. Well, got I, in the I, truck. it's true. It takes them a while to get to the truck. Before, um, before we get too much further, I gotta uh -huh. ask you: like, did you watch this movie in high school? Huh? Yeah. I did. <laughs> uh, okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, um, I could just briefly say how I found this film. I used to go. I would to love to hear the, that story. 
I used to go to the library all the time because I was a poor kid and I couldn't afford to rent movies. So I wound up watching just about every movie they had at the library. And this was one of those ones that had absolutely no warning on the label. I just saw it and I was like, this looks crazy. And then I read the back and I'm like, this sounds crazy. And nobody <laughs> knew anything about it. And it's like, it's like an immediate snap. Like when you read the, uh, the high concept of it, it's like desperate men oh, sure. with a desperate job in a desperate location. It sounds awesome. And then I watched yeah. it and I started talking to people about it. And everyone's like, yeah, I don't know anything about that movie. Yeah, so it was so like think, my first like discovering a movie. I think it's truly then, yeah. very much uh, like high concepts in terms of high concept concepts. And obviously this is from the original novel, the nitroglycerin mm -hmm. thing, but it's like diehard level. Like, oh, this is just a sell a solid concept. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I, and it, it, having such a strong concept uh, and then having the Waylon Green sort of script with Friedkin kind of, you know, he's one of those directors that in the seventies that love like the French new wave and Italian neorealism and that kind of stuff. A lot of directors were kind of hip to that. And Friedkin was one of the forefronts of it. And, you know, at the time he made this movie, he just made the exorcist, which made a ton of money. So, I mean, they, mm. you know, uh, uh, Friedkin even famously said like, they would have paid for my nephew's bat mitzvah. If I asked them, you know, like they were, they were ready to give me anything I wanted. Um, and yeah. And that was the end of that. After I think this movie. it's worth, well, it's worth crediting the uh, uh, the fact that this concept was not from Friedkin nor the 53 movie, but from Georges Arnaud, who wrote the novel, which mm -hmm. it's all. Sure. And, and Friedkin did say this is not an adaptation of the 53 movie. It's an adaptation of the novel. I wish sure. I could find a little bit more about the details of the original novel, because I do wonder uh, how much they take time that book takes. That's a good uh, question, too, because um, even the way establishing the movie is kind of cut. You know, Boref brought up the the prologue of when you meet all four characters. You know, that's almost spaced out kind of like a novel. It's like 30 or one, 40 minutes here's long. Here's this one, you know, chapter yeah. two. Here's this person, chapter three. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, it cuts well, itself some into... Of those, some of that's almost a third of the movie, off, yeah. It's, some of it's also based off real stuff. Like, the, uh, the crime that happened at the church was actually based off a real crime. And I guess one of the people who was responsible for that crime was in that scene as an extra. Mm. Um... So, but it's funny because they didn't, like, William Friedkin got, like, a ton of money to do this, but he couldn't get the actors he wanted. Like, that's something I read after the fact because it was, like, one of those IMDb, like, yeah. notes, which I yeah, always thought was I, funny. I, there's a, on the Blu-ray uh, special that they released in 2016, there's a conversation with Friedkin and uh, Nicholas Reffin, the director of Drive and, and, you know, Only God Can Kill or whatever. Um <laughs> And Friedkin talks about this because he goes into great length and he, he wrote his book about it. It's all over his chapter. He's got a whole chapters about Sorcerer in his book, um, which I haven't read. But uh, I watched a little bit of that interview and Friedkin talks about uh, his original cast and his original cast. Roy Schneider was supposed to be played by Steve McQueen. And according to Friedkin, F McQueen, who just got married to Ali McGraw, really wanted a part for Ali and, you know, Friedkin kind of jokes. He said, you just said it was the best script you ever read and now you want to start changing it what the fuck um so that had a falling out but he originally wanted marcello mastriani uh which i think would have been awesome to have marcello mastriani in this fucking movie because yeah he's awesome um but he dropped was... out because something to do with his well, wife surely i mean schneider was probably he had to be somewhat hot at this point because jaws was relatively recent more recent sure. than the exorcist even yeah at this sure point. Because at that point, even even in his early stages of the career, uh, he was more or less like a side character in a lot of things, yeah. like, you know, uh, Marathon Man and, and French Connection, what have you. Well, uh, how did you guys feel about the actors that were in it? Do you think that the uh, characters would have played a little bit more intense if they'd had different actors, like uh, Marcello Mastriani rather than Francesco Rabal, or did it still play okay for you? It played I was okay. wondering, because I, I thought it played I, I, I was about okay that. With it. No, I yeah, think it played. I, I think I, it, I, I, yeah. I, I like the fact that it was Roy Schneider because, like, yeah. it's rare for him to get kind of a shot like this. And you know, he basically just had to dig deep and pull out his inner bogey from Trezor Sierra Madre. So, like, that's yeah. kind of get it. Uh, I always kind of uh, like that one better too, simply because he seems like more of an everyman. He didn't seem like a leading man, so it yeah. seemed like it was almost against type. Like, 
he's like someone who you could imagine getting seriously injured as opposed to like an Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. You know and, I mean? and, you know, like it's, it's because it's Roy Schneider, like, unlike, you know, Steve McQueen's going to make it at the end of the movie, you know, like that's implied when you're watching a Steve McQueen movie. Uh, you're not so sure about a guy like Roy Schneider might not make it. You don't know, you know, and that's the the way they pace out these four characters is they really do make it so like, uh, you know, none of these people might make it, guys. You know, like the movie is very clear with you. Like this, this is might end badly for everybody and probably will. Um, mm. And so I, I, I kind of think that kind of plays against it too. And also I think having kind of relatively unknowns kind of lent to, because the film itself is very like, 70s gritty you know everything's really shot on this you know location must have been a nightmare fucking shoot um and from reports it sounds like it was um and you know every it kind of adds that kind of again you kind of you get to follow it and because there's no dialogue and you're kind of only compelled there's very little dialogue in this movie um and so because of that you don't really know these people as well as you would know marcella mastriani and and steve mcqueen i i think that it kind of works for it. I think it works. Yeah, I think that it does too. I think that it makes it better that they're not, uh, in many ways, I think it's stronger for them being um, not, I mean, obviously 70s movie stars are different from movie stars today, but there's still a difference between normal looking folks and 70s movie stars. And these people, yeah, like, I mean, look like, really normal fucking people who could be living in a shitty village in the middle of fucking South Africa mm -hmm. uh, or South America. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it works for me. I think more strongly to have them just be mostly faces I'd never seen before. And then Roy Schneider, who even in jaws is like, he has this big moment at the end, but he's, he's not Steve McQueen doing fucking crazy shit. Like, yeah, uh, he's still mostly a normal ass dude trying to raise Peter. a family. That movie's about Quint, okay? That's yeah. what that movie's about. <laughs> um, you know, and that's why I think that. Uh, but I mean, he also, I mean, he didn't. He tried to get Paul Newman into it, which I think would have been interesting because he likes playing roles like this. But I, again, I think he draw, especially in the seventies, I think he would draw too much attention to himself and kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and I even. But the other person who they thought, and I thought this was interesting, that they got really close to getting instead of Roy Schneider was Warren Oates who you will remember as Benny mm -hmm. from Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. That would have um, been awesome. That would have been actually pretty okay, you know, at least to not see him with the sunglasses on all the time. Um, <laughs> anyway. Well, um, but yeah, no, I kind of like the fact that it was an unknown choices. I, I kind of, I dig in it. In spite of that, uh, I mean, Roy Schneider, obviously, probably like this was the height of his career, riding a little high after Jaws. Um, and, you know, uh, The Exorcist was a big hit, but that culture of like those hit movies that were a little bit more genre E also uh, victimized this movie a little bit because it did not do great because it came out one month after a little film called star Wars that was absolutely slaying at the box office. Yeah. And then when they opened sorcerer and everyone found out, wait, star Wars is gone. Well, fuck this. I'm out of here. Um, oh, I doubt it. Yeah, oh, there's yeah, no way yeah. star Wars was gone. Movies used to play yeah, it for six had to months bring it back, back in the day. Because they, they, they had to bring it back because nobody was showing up to watch Sorcerer. Um, yeah. And, and a, there yeah. was a lot of blame going on of why this movie didn't do very well. I mean, Freed, uh, for the, well, the studios blamed the title, which I think is stupid. Um, I think I, they, I kind of think that might be valid, though, because I had I no idea why. what it was about listening to well, that Well, neither title. did Russell, clearly, I know, last episode. I, I know, but I kind of dig that title. I, I like that it implies this sort of, like, nor did I in fact in the chat. agency um I, I like that it sort of implies this sort of magic about it you know and everything and that kind of happens are things that are outside of their control just for um, reference for the listener the title sorcerer uh refers to one of the trucks uh is called sorcerer I believe the word sorcerer is written on the hood of one of the two one of the two trucks they're taking uh, across uh, I think it's the one that breaks down at the end yeah yeah, sorcerer. I think sorcerer survives because I think the other one is the one that goes over the. Well, it yeah. survives. It gets abandoned because it, it, you kind of in the plot too. I also thought it was interesting too because you know they saw sorcerer after he had just done exorcist, so they're thinking scary dark magic, right? That's what yeah, most that's audiences true. would would assume. Um, 
And, I mean, that's what I thought when I was a kid and I got it at the library. I, I was like, it. ooh, okay, South it. America, sorcerer, something spooky going to happen. And it, I don't know. I, sure. I, think, I dig it I when movies like try to West, make you lean in. Like that I West dig Craven it when they movie make you lean into Bill a punch Pullman. and you, you, you totally miss it. You know, I, I, I love that. I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, but yeah. I, I understand where you're coming from. I understand their thought process because movie going audiences in the 70s because this is the point i think i wanted to bring up about star wars is because like star wars coming out and this movie kind of bombing is kind of a interesting point in film history because it's kind sure. of the, the beginning of the point, end yeah. of the of the rebel hollywood of the 70s and late 60s you know but it also was an inflection point of the sophistication of the audience versus the sophistication of the directors what i mean by that is that william friedkin had a very high opinion of you know William Old French New Wave, yeah, and himself, <laughs> but like French New Wave and Italian neorealism, he he would always most anytime you talk to him, it's a lecture about that era of film. Yeah. Um, so, but the audiences really just wanted to go watch shit blow up and pew 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 pew, you know, like so there is an inflection point of where the audience is willing to pay for and pay for a lot versus just oh that was yeah. a stunning character I'll, journey. I could you know? see, yeah, I think this movie. I think even in legacy has been probably harmed by the exact timing, you know, um, of when it came out. Like, I think that that easy writer to raging bull era, even though raging bull, I think was a little after this, um, like this star Wars was for sure jaws to some extent. And star Wars even more was the beginning of the end. And, and it being so overlooked, if this had come out like a year earlier, right before that blockbuster thing like found its symbol yeah. like it's it's avatar in star mm -hmm. wars which to right. this day is some ways still true like sure. the mcu may be a little bigger but still star yeah. wars is like you can guarantee well, if a star wars yeah. movie's coming out top two or three movie of the year every time but what was that like tentpole shift in terms yeah. of how they would budget the entire studio like they but needed wonder... the star wars to cover things like sorcerer if this came out a year prior in 76, right? Like maybe it would have much more of a legacy instead of being almost utterly and completely forgotten. Uh, even by the standards of most like kind of obscure seventies movies, I had never heard of this thing. Yeah. I also wonder how much of it is just show business pettiness too, because Paramount and, and, and uh, <laughs> William Friedkin did not get along at sure. all. Um, so maybe it was like Paramount saying, I'm going to bury it just because he's a dick. And, you know, like, I mean, it it is also valid to ask because it is a remake. Like, I know that mm -hmm. he says he based mm -hmm. it off the book, not the original movie. Sure. But even with that, like the original movie is the uh, Clouson, I think. Henri Clouson. 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 And, you know, I mean, we all know he's the guy from Diabolique and things like that. He was evidently yeah. like a real brutal director uh, uh put his wife in the original again uh he kept working with his wife but it's a film that has been kind of remembered since then it got like a criterion edition it's you know been lauded for a lot of things as like an intense tense thriller um i wonder if that kind of hurt this one because this one is also a good movie i like this one a lot still uh, yeah i think it's the very but, at the very yeah. least i think most yeah. people who see it would find it interesting it's not boring. I mean, it's really yeah. thrilling. I mean, like it, you really, you're really like, fuck, you know, like it's, 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 it's a good for, again, there's not a lot of explosion, not a lot of pew pew gunfights, but man, you're, you're like, they're not going to make it, you know, like yeah, this, yeah. this isn't going to work. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, it's, like, it, it, it was, so, I mean, having not seen the original, but I, rem I, I, I read that, that, that was part of what led to its critical and commercial failure as well was that, everyone kept comparing it to the original wages of fear it, but it's funny isn't it funny that like the coen brothers did the same thing for true grit right like everybody yeah. knows the john wayne film and then they go ahead and remake it based off the novel sort of similar to what friedkin did and then it gets nominated for oscars and shit i mean i grant that it's the coen brothers and they can get away with murder in hollywood but um not so much and again it, it, since studios are starting to recognize the fact wait a minute i don't need to kiss william friedkin's ass to make a ton of money i, I could just buy a, a good property like Superman and go to town. Um, you know, so it, it is kind of like, it, it's, it, it's, I love this film. I actually thought it was a fucking great film for it. I'm, I'm surprised <laughs> that, uh, that you chose this movie. Cause like, this is for a high school. Cause I'm trying to think of myself in high school trying to watch it. And I think I would probably have the same reaction. Cause I would probably be like, 
okay, it's called Sorcerer, directed by an exorcist guy, and we're driving around in a truck. You know, like it would take you a while to get there, and then once you once you're in, because you like like Zach said, it's a good thirty minutes in that prologue of introducing the characters, and but, not but all prologue, of it's in English. In the defense, you know, I think the prologue works. Oh, I think great. it rocks. Yeah, I really like. I, that I love it. Um, yeah, it yeah, snaps it, it, along it, real quick. It's like the perfect amount of backstory for each character. Not too much, not too little. You get enough info about the French guy that he's not just some dude. He's someone who you can kind of understand he was a probably an okay person who got himself into a bad spot even though he's not really the main character it's it's more of an ensemble cast which is probably more like the wild bunch yeah 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 i mean but uh, uh, yeah like to, to a degree yeah i mean they make it clear that they're all kind of shitty people like even the french guy there's no way he was not knowingly committing white collar crime yeah, yeah. Like he definitely knew what the fuck was up before before the hammer came down. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's it. It it, it works because you know it, it it flings these characters into a specific spot um, that is clearly just like the bottom of the bottom, yeah. and that's where they have to exist. And in order to climb their way out of the bottom, they have to do this very crazy and dangerous adventure. Um, but it's worth it to them to get out of this hell hole that they live in um, and work in, and the work sucks. I mean, it does show that, like, boy, capitalism's great, and that, you know, oil companies are really great yeah. people. Well, um, that the, the original was even more on the nose about it. Like, they have a famous line in there about um, uh, really? wherever yeah. there's oil, wherever there's oil, you'll find Americans. Okay, that, fair. Because, yeah, like, yeah, the, yeah. the Americans aren't, like, part of the group. The Americans are, like, this, like, other group yeah. that's managing, like, uh, it's a military group managing oil in South America in the original. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of hates the Americans because it's, like, all the main characters are all French. So they're all speaking French. There's no American in it. So it's a little more open with the, you know, fuck capitalism um, sure. end of it. Well, and, and again, 1953, you know, this is post-war Europe. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're a little more cynical. And that's why it's it is it, the it's interesting that all of these directors from the American seventies and late sixties, you know, kind of empathized with the post war Europe filmmakers because oh. I think they themselves felt like they were going through something similar with Vietnam and the civil rights, everything was kind of spiraling out of control and whatever. So I, I think it's interesting that they, a lot of those directors flocked to that era of film. Um I, I and, do and have the fear is one of them. One slight question. Um the assassin character nilo um i uh it was with the other three characters it was extremely clear to me why they ended up in this little poverty stricken nowhere bird right like they were on the run they were out of options nilo's never shown like he's shown killing him but he seems to get away with it perfectly fine he shows up in a private plane is he so is, i'm not entirely like he I'm, kills the, the, the Nazi to get on the track. I'm not sure truck, if he was a yeah. saboteur or. No, um, I think he was doing it for the money. I think that he's a cartel hitman or some shit and, well, and sees the, a, an opportunity to make an easy buck. I think that's the, what he, that is not an easy buck. Well, no, it's not. Uh, yeah, right. One, one thing I'll say is he dev, he definitely is the ambiguity in this because you don't quite know why he's doing it you don't know what his reasoning is you just know that he killed someone and they have the worst uh interview process ever to go on these trucks where it's like well See, we need a driver part of me wondered um, part way through the movie if he or the cartel he was involved with had something to do with the bombing of the oil rig and that he was intentionally a poison pill to make sure it didn't the problem didn't get fixed and well in the original um in the original he was a, a separate character like they didn't go into the backstory of his character in the original i think because it was um uh basically you had the main two it really focused on the two characters and with the nilo character in the original he was a guy who had a lot of money he was like someone who was on the run who had just come to this town not someone who'd been there for a while so he was able to afford and buy things that the other guys there had long since burned through all their money and couldn't afford to buy. So he was sort of the rich man who was brought into this thing. And then it gets way more, um, you know, just like in this movie, it gets way more desperate, way more concerned. And it's like a lot clearer 
that the Nilo character in the original was lazy as hell. Like he was a rich man who thought he could pay his way through everything. And then when they go out on the trucks, it's like, oh no, you get to die with the rest of us if you don't do this right. Um, which has a real grim ending for some of the characters in the original. Definitely worth going back to see the original if you ever get a chance. Okay, Borifal, you just got my bonus point because you at least watched the original, but so good job. <laughs> Yeah, good job. I should actually say, I didn't get to say that before I uh, sent us on this rocky journey. I probably should have been clear about the pay on this. Um, so uh, before this, uh, Boref, you are out of bonus points and uh, <laughs> you have 11 points to give out. Uh, you have 11 points for final voting. I have two points, now one point um, with 11 points at final voting. Zach has all of his bonus points, but he has 12 points for final voting. So the new score is now 12 with me at one point for you. Okay. Sorry. Fair. But yeah, no, I, 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 I really did kind of want to see it because like even even in watching uh, the 77, the Sorcerer movie, I, I got the sense that like I didn't know it was a remake until after I'd watched it and I was reading about it. Uh, I got the sense that like this could have been like if this movie were made in like the Hollywood 40s, like it would be you, the plot wouldn't have to change all that much, but there would be a lot more fucking dialogue. Uh, there'd be yeah. a lot more like talking like, hey, you need to be careful there. Well, me back then, it would be a lot more terse. And it would be a lot more, um, I don't think you'd get that atmosphere of dread that this movie really gets. Like, I think that this movie nails it right down to the Tangerine Dream soundtrack. You know, I think that it's- Which I think this was their first soundtrack. I don't think so. I thought no? they did, no, maybe. I, uh, maybe. I, I, the, I don't the think The soundtrack was a little wild for me. I'll be honest. I completely forgot that it was this heavy on the synth. So yeah. some of it was a little hard for me to return to just because it was, it, it almost felt like Lady Hawk where you're watching something <laughs> and it's so intense with the techno. Uh, I would have expected something way more gritty or maybe just something else. Uh, but <laughs> that said, I still liked it just fine. It didn't take I, me out of it. Yeah, I, I, if it had gotten a little bit, and, and luckily it's not used all that often, you know, cause like Tangerine Dream apparently only made this crown, made the, the music from reading the script. They didn't see a frame of the film. Um, so they they just kind of and and, and and I actually didn't use it all that much. I mean, there's it's very specific parts where they use it, and that's where I think it kind of works. Even though, yeah, I, I kind of can see your kind of the fact that it's so spacey and like out there, it does kind of feel a little out of place. But again, it, with the title like Sorcerer, it kind of allows that play where like it allows like th there is something not right about the nature of this whole film, and that there is something infinitely nefarious that nobody can really control. And I think the synth soundtrack kind of adds to that sort of alienness to it. And I, I don't know, I dug it. Yeah. I mean, it's wonderfully nihilistic. It's, uh, well, and that's of, similar to the yeah. theme of the era, isn't it? I mean, like, you know, I mean, Peckinpah, we did a whole thing about Peckinpah. It's, it's all that 70s shit. I mean, I would even argue Jaws is nihilistic. You know, I would even, that's, well, it, yeah, but he this makes it at the like, end, but. This one has like the extra sauce. It's like, it's nihilistic, but it's like, there's no way out. And it's just like brutally difficult circumstances. And you kind right. of wonder if they're going to make it through I mean, or not. This Suffocate. is also the kind yeah. of movie, I mean, you could argue, I mean, again, Reservoir Dogs, not entirely different in this regard, but uh, even the character that gets out doesn't really get out. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, he so. seems like you've he's escaped from, from hell and whatever the sins of his past come back and and get him anyway maybe because of the acclaim maybe because this like accomplishment brought so much uh you know attention to this particular story that these people were able to find him i mean it's possible that succeeding in and of itself is what got him killed <laughs> T tarantino's on record by the way about this being one of his favorites uh um, yeah oh I'm not super. Yeah, movie. it so seems. I'm not. I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, yeah, it does seem. I do think it kind of went well with uh, the pick from last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, it's I, very uh, abrupt when it kills people. Like they don't play around. Oh, for sure. I did. Yeah, the two. The two. I, I can't believe that two of the characters a died together and b. I mean, literally, like they were just in the middle of a conversation. The tire goes and they are dead. <laughs> Yeah. Like, <laughs> yep, that's right. Yeah, it's like okay, well, we made it past the tree because even during the tree, you're like, God, this isn't gonna work. You're gonna blow well, yourselves up. I will. Yeah, uh, go I'm not gonna spoil the original since you guys haven't seen it, but I will say that I think the scene with the truck exploding is an homage to the original because there's a specific kind of classic moment in the original movie that I always remember, 
that definitely borrowed from that. Well, and it's possible if if it's especially similar. I mean, it could just be that that's the way it is in the novel. I will say yeah. this: the no, the the original film has a Wikipedia page. The original novel does not, so it's hard to figure out what's in the original novel. Well, now we're gonna have um, to just find the original novel and just read it. We're all gonna have to read it, guys. Welcome to the book trap club. Welcome to the book trap. It's worth noting we talked about like the capitalist uh, or anti-capitalist leanings of this. Like, the original film and novel are called "The Wages of Fear." Like, you know, yeah. I think that that's not 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 subtle. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I love I love that original title. I wish they I kind of wish they had just stuck with the original title because yeah, it's so yeah. solid. I know it's a great title and I, I love it for the book and I even love it for the era of 1950s, but man, Sorcerer has that kind of special sauce to it that like, I, I love it when the, it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, you're pulling a curtain behind there and there is no wizard. There's no Sorcerer. It's a fucking truck. Um, I, 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 I dig it. Um, but I, I, I do think was, was the original as ambitious as this production was? Cause this was a pretty fucking ambitious production. I do know the kind original is of. definitely considered a, a, from what I've read, like quite a classic, but I'm yeah, I don't know. Okay. I yeah, don't know it, if they would do the guerrilla style seventy filmmaking, seventies film. Right. Movie. Yeah. No. I mean, because like that that bridge scene, we could talk about because that's one of the best scenes in the movie and must have been a fucking nightmare to do. Sure. Um, but uh, it boy, it yeah. was. It, there, there's a couple I, scenes I want to talk about killed, in detail, but but like that scene was one of the and and apparently it was built on hydraulics. Like the 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 bridge itself was sound and safe it was just meant to look that but yeah, problem it was is it kind of like a disney safe. ride yeah yeah but then friedkin wanted rain and so he just flew a helicopter down and created rain and made everything that much more dangerous roy schneider yeah. said that was the worst experience of his life and it looked like it it looked like yeah it. yeah i mean it looked so i mean it, it sucks that that, you know, considering that the wages of fear, these people, like these characters themselves are having to put their own lives at uh, instant risk. And the movie crew Whoa. and the actors well, are kind of doing see. the same thing. <laughs> since, 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 I mean, yes, yeah, the question and, and Chris has seen, seen the, uh, the original or at least some of it, um, like, does it seem on the screen like it's as dangerously filmed as this? Uh, no, I would say this this one definitely had more of the like run and gun camera style where I, you could tell that like a great deal of filming improvements that occurred over time. Um, like they had cameras they could tie into things that were smaller and things like that. The original film was basically all on sticks, I believe, except for a couple um, sequences. And even the action sequences they show are more based off sort of the Hitchcock, like the eyes on the steering wheel, on the thing, on the road, and it cuts back and forth on like close-ups. This one was way more of like the grand scale of like, oh my God, it's a whole bridge. Oh my God, they're driving cool. through a real jungle. Okay. The original I'm gonna give, uh... was essentially uh, not, as far as I can remember, it wasn't really in a jungle that much. Like their version of a jungle was more like, a desert with a lot of sure. mud and stuff and it was okay. a little bit more like being in mexico than it was being in the actual rainforest okay well uh, right, yeah. i i think i'll i think i will give chris one of my points just because uh, his insight on the original versus this i think is uh valuable to the conversation and worth very rewarding very true well, yep that's thanks. right you did your Thank homework you. buddy <laughs> um Zach and I are a bunch of slouches. Um, uh, yeah, and that's why I, that that sort of makes sense too. Because as I said, as I was watching this, this, this was made, you know, thirty years prior to when it was made. It would have been like that, all on sticks. We're all gonna walk in front mm -hmm. of the camera. Here's a truck. Well, here's the truck, and everything's gonna tell you exactly what they're gonna sure. do. Then they're gonna get in the car and be like, "So, what did you do before this?" Well, I did this and this and this. You know, like it. it mm -hmm. You could feel that in the DNA of this movie. You know, you could feel that this movie, under a different set of hands, could have just been a pretty basic movie but i think yeah. with the script and with friedkin you know kind of the 70s madness that they embraced and ran with um i think it works and and i think adding the color of the green with the jungle um and having it just fucking everywhere um is is great um, um I, I i did want to talk about also the the dream sequence too the kind of like because we kind of get into like, like this weird speaking of alfredo garcia um you know where he's driving with uh with his buddy who's been killed mm -hmm. 
and he kind of there's this weird that's when the tangerine dream music's in like or, full effect, yeah he's and, dying for yeah, sure like, and he's, he's kind of talking young. to him yeah kind of similar to how you know benny was talking to the head and then Alfredo. ultimately nilo dies pretty much simultaneously with the truck yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's uh, uh there is more characterization between those two characters in the original um and the death I'm not going to ruin it, but it's one of the best screen deaths I think I've ever seen no, because it's, cool. it's, it's, it's something that happens between characters and it's horrifying. Uh, yeah. um, but I, knew I, uh, I would but like to ask you I guys. Think that, uh, oh, could I, uh, but in Go terms ahead. of that you... sequence that Russell's talking about, like clearly it is, it's a sequence where Roy Schneider has been through a lot uh, at that point. Uh, just about everything he goes through in the entire film. He's disassociating. He's kind of losing his mind. He's reckoning with not just the events of the film, but his life prior to that, the crash that, you know, sent him to this poor village, an entire life of wrongdoing. Yeah, it's a moment of like, if, uh, if this is sort of a, you know, journey through hell, obviously this is the reckoning and rebirth of this character moment. Yeah. Where he has yeah. to consider, I don't know, everything that made, brought him to this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it, it is kind of like Alfredo Garcia where he's just finally unraveled, you know, like I can't yeah. imagine, like the film does a really good job of putting you in the audience, like in that level of high stress and high anxiety. It really does a good job about that. Um, where like one wrong move, like, and you don't even know what move that's going to be. And that's it. You know, like that, yeah. that they, the, the film does a really good job of you're in there. So really by the end of the movie, I'm with Roy Schneider. I'm like, I'm, I'm I've lost it. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but you're brutal. in the middle of nowhere. Where are you going to go? Oh, it's, it, it was, it's a brutal movie. I mean, this sure. movie is, is, is the production seemed brutal. The stories the way it's presented doesn't have to be brutal, but they choose to make it this sort of very vicious atmosphere throughout the whole movie. Um, well, yeah. I got a, I got a question for you guys, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I noticed in that dream sequence that jumped out at me the most was the day for night uh, that they yeah. did with blue. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it reminded me, I don't know if this reminded you guys, but of all the day for night they did in Fury Road, hmm. like the intense blues and where stuff it was like almost, that purposely stylized to the degree yeah. that yeah mm -hmm. so since that one jumped out at me i was wondering have you guys seen any like um influences of this movie and other things or just other places you think might i have mean referenced it? W literally talking about tarantino i feel like there are yeah, influences I've, this movie yeah, and tarantino. I feel like that, that, that's an easy one and i also think that um you know the fact that uh nicholas Ryphon um I, I think that's another good comparison too, but I also think Fury Road's a fantastic comparison, even with the whole. Because one of the best yeah, parts absolutely. of Fury Road, one of the best parts of Fury Road, in my opinion, is um, when you know they finally break out and then they drive into the sandstorm. See, what I like about that sequence I mean, is that it it shows that there's constant danger around you all the time, but there's an even greater danger, and that's the world that they live in, and that's yeah. what I Sorcerer reminded me of that a lot. And it's it's not for nothing that. Sorcerer and Fury Road are both about a small group of people in a shitty, rickety, custom-built truck traveling several hundred miles to... Right. For yeah. the for, hope of a better future that they for, yeah. don't know actually exists. Yeah, exactly. You know, like that's, it's, but they got to try because it's better than this. You know, I, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I could see a lot of Mad Max in this, you know, a lot of that, like, the, that. that's a good one. Even fucking you know, the second Mad Max. Um, yeah. There's a kind of lot of, cause there's a lot of end of the world shit here. You know, there's a lot of like, kind of, you know, it, like if you look at, if you take the nitroglycerin as a metaphor for the atomic bomb and what, and each one of these characters are a country in the world that have to trug along this atom bomb around a rocky road. Um, and again, even in 1950, I think that, you know, that's kind of under, underlying the sort of subtext of this film and that's what plays into everybody's anxieties because even even as late as the 70s that was still prevalent you know like even that was still you know we were still shit scary we were in a hot war with vietnam you know like it, it it that anxiety still existed and i think existed better 
an American audience. I think this movie got a bad rap when it came out. I mean, I really right. do. I think this movie got a serious bad rap. Um, I got, I part of it's got, Friedkin, but part of it is just, I think, that the changing of Hollywood. I got one uh, very intentional and uh, uh, openly stated reference to this movie from another later piece of work. Um, give me just one sec to find the exact... Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so there is a scene, and a classic scene, in which a character is driving uh, through some treacherous mountain roads uh, that is directly um, meant, according to the creator of the show, to be a reference to Sorcerer, and that is the Mr. Plow episode of The Simpsons is <laughs> actually it. directly a, a reference <laughs> to Sorcerer. According to Al Jean, it is, in fact, yes, 100% a reference to Sorcerer, that, that episode of The Simpsons. That's so there great. you go. God, you know, if, if there are so have, many... I would have not have pegged a Simpsons reference to come up from this movie. <laughs> oh, what? Have you ever seen The Simpsons? They reference, like, esoteric I stuff have. all the it's time. Just, like, it's they hilarious. make a joke about the naked lunch, for God's sakes. Um, you know, like, it. it anyway, uh, that... That tracks, and especially because the thing about the Simpsons is they're all a bunch of nerds, right? They're all a bunch of like Harvard geeks, you know, and they, they you know, like they, they love stuff like this because it's so, it's so, what you got to appreciate about Friedkin is he is it, as chaotic and frenetic as his shoots are. He is, he thinks of it very academically. I'm not saying he pulls it off, but he definitely thinks of it in an academic sense. Um, so, you know, like I said, there's a sophistication in directors and a sophistication in the audience that might have been at the same meeting point in the late sixties and early seventies, but the sophistication of the audience was slowly drifting away because, uh, the, people wanted escapism. People wanted, you know, sort of more fun movies. Um, Jaws is kind of like that, but I think Star Wars is really the, the, the beginning of the end. Um, yeah. and, and, and what? Sorcerer apparently was the first casualty. I think that's from Mark. Well, Looking at his filmography, I think Sorcerer, 1977, it definitely was an inflection point and a change because it looks like the next ones that came out were The Brinks Job, Cruising, which is known for being really uh, mm -hmm. and intense how. at the time, but also mm -hmm. kind of homophobic. Super homophobic. Kinda. Jesus. <laughs> I haven't seen it myself, but I assume it's I have really not homophobic. seen it either, but I, I have, have, I have heard it. enough of a description to know that I it is. Seen it. Like yeah. all of the criticisms you get about uh, Silence of the Lambs, just for like the Buffalo Bill character, crank those right the fuck up to 10. Yep. Yep. Okay, no, there's yeah. nothing. Yeah, no, I mean, even Al, I mean, Al Pacino's fine in it, I guess. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, it looks like the only, uh, the later thing he did that got him a lot of attention after this was uh, To Live and Die in LA and mm -hmm. Killer Joe. Um, mm -hmm. and, and Bug got a little bug, harder. Bug got a bit, yeah. Uh, but it seems like you know other than like jade um which i think bombed as well like he hasn't really done a whole lot since the exorcist and uh the big classics he did um yeah french connection and french stuff. connection and, and it's true i mean and, and and many probably a lot of people would say that this was the beginning of his sort of fall from grace because he was a hot ticket by after french connection and exorcist and yeah. then you know he butted heads so badly with the studios on this one. I think that they just decided he's too much of a pain in the ass to work with. It's um, too bad because this it is because I, like, I really I still like this one a lot. I, I, I still I like this one as an adult. Solid. I I, actually, I like The Exorcist. I like The French Connection. I think I want that, to you know, spend a moment to talk because we talked about these other scenes. You know, um, I think the bridge scene is very flashy for being like such an uh you know insane chaotic moment that's absolutely off the wall you know you get the dream sequence which is very stylistic my favorite scene is uh i think watching them devise this device to clear the tree because they never tell you what they're doing you you just see the idea come into fruition like you first see these this trio of sticks above the tree and you get the intention okay maybe they're gonna use the dynamite but how like it's obviously deeply unstable they have the rock. They have Nilo pull out his pockets. And it's like, is this bag the right size? It's like, are they putting the dynamite in the bag? Like, that's mm -hmm. what I thought for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, and then dropping it onto the rock. or And then you get the reveal of like, oh, it's the timer. Like, the pocket is literally the timer for this jury rig device. So they have sand that will, yeah. you know, pour out after they stab it. 
allowing them to get far enough away to get to safety. Like, I think that as visual storytelling goes, where they never, ever explain it and you just see it come together. I love that scene. It's my favorite scene, I think, in the entire movie. I, yeah, I concur. I, That's one of the best ones. I agree. Yeah. If I had points, I'd give you a point. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree. Cause it was kind of perfect. Cause that character, you find out like, he's the guy who was causing a bunch of explosions at the start of the movie. He was right. the Palestinian, yeah. but like, it's such a like nonverbal way to understand what's happening. And it's like, he doesn't even ask, there's no moment where they sit down and have a conversation about it. He's just like, I'm going to do it. And he just starts yeah, doing he- it. Roy Schneider is freaking out. He's trying to clear a path through the swamp, which will never work. He's like, we just have to clear like eight trees or something. And it's like deep, deep swamp water. Um, And then he just goes off by himself silently, gets on top of the tree, looks at it and comes back and is like, I think I can clear it. And then (laughs) you just get this montage of them like creating this thing. And the Mm -hmm. only dialogue I think of the entire montage is when he, Nilo, he asks Nilo to pull out his pocket. And there's, which is also a great moment because there's conflict between those two characters because mm-hmm. the Palestinian character liked the Nazi that got murdered. Ah, to yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that yeah. was an interesting one. Cause it occurred to me like, yeah, they probably would be, both of them would have the hatred of Jewish people to chat about probably. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then even, even then I wasn't sure if they were really friends or if it was just that he saw the other person as an interloper who was willing to kill to be on that truck. So he didn't trust him. He seemed upset when the guy didn't show. Yeah. Mm. I, I kind of, but you also get the sense. I think it, it it's a good play because you get the sense that these guys might be like friendly, but they're not necessarily friends. Cause there's that one scene no. in Roy Schneider's in the bar and like Bruno Kreller comes in and they like kind of have a brief bonding moment. This is before the, the pinch comes up about driving the nitroglycerin and like the authorities come in and need to talk to Roy Schneider about something or whatever. And like Bruno Kreller's like, I don't know this fucking guy. Get him the fuck away from me. You know, even though he just, I just but, bought him a drink, you know. Interestingly. Like, yeah. I do think that there are, but near the end of the film, I think there are moments of like flourishing friendship, like right before Kasem and Victor die, it mm-hmm. seems like they are starting to, bond a little bit like they're talking about their personal lives you know previously no one was willing at the bar no one was willing to give any real information about where they came from and at this point they're starting to reveal like history to each other and the same thing Mm -hmm. with nilo when he's dying and uh jackie takes the time to actually put him in the car and listen to him like by the end of this fucking endurance test there are like flashes of these people becoming friends in a way yeah well, it's, it, it's, it's funny because that happens in the movie you picked in the very first scene for sure like that was one of the things that's that after yeah like when you said that yeah it's like that movie starts near the end right of the yeah yeah the and it, 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 it also it, i mean it kind of reminds me of the wild bunch a little bit too you know where like you you battle is what hardens people and solidifies bonds you know and tribulations will create bonds that last forever kind of thing and i think Waylon green kind of likes that concept and that's where this film done so i mean again when you're talking about those two bonding i mean i really should have seen it coming well now they're dead like i really should have said like well this this isn't gonna end well because we're look how look how human they are (laughs) you know i mean it seems like that's a pretty uh that's something that would definitely play for filmmakers like being on set is usually a fairly harrowing experience um it's sometimes pretty nice but sometimes it can be really rough and i've noticed that the rough shoots tend to be the ones where you make friends that you remember yeah. after that because yeah. it's like you've gone through or some stuff bitter together. bitter enemies <laughs> if someone's causing the trouble bitter enemies yes because apparently a freed kid and roy schneider were kind of close before this but after this movie i think that like that, that was roy schneider was mm. like tired of doing that job and, and I, I mean freed kid himself said like i was losing crew members to gangrene i was i mean it was a brutal brutal shoot and yeah. Friedkin's kind of famous for overshooting too. So like it took a long time and it went over budget. And like he I, does. I will say, um, yeah, the, the most uh, we have talked about the Reservoir Dogs connection. I don't know if I said this explicitly, but I do want to say it explicitly just because I think it's the, the moment that is the most clear, you know, connection. That opening robbery where they're all in black suits and ties and it falls apart because one of them was too violent during the course of the robbery and they start to argue amongst each other. Like that is the moment where, where it was like, 
but I think that Chris's point is extremely well. Des- you know what? It, I think Chris's point there about uh, these characters who are so closed off about their past, their criminal pasts, um, slowly revealing themselves, being a, a metaphor for res- like a, a parallel to Reservoir Dogs, is so well observed. I'm going to give him another point. I think that's All a right, good. Sure. Wow. I think that's a good. I think that's a good parallel. You, you guys are giving away too many points. You got to save some for that last. You gave one. all your points of the first that's episode. True. Yeah, man. I mean, what, yeah, right. Easy there. Easy there. Um, well, thank cool. you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. No. That's, that's, uh, so we should we venture into final thoughts? I guess. Um, yeah. Unless you yeah, guys absolutely. have anything really burning, I'll, I'll go ahead and start since I've got to announce my movie next, and I really don't know how I'm gonna uh, follow up. Well, I know how I'm gonna follow up with it. I just don't know how it's gonna be received. Um, so good movie, like really, Borif, well done. I, I I almost give you my last point for choosing this movie, but I'm not going to. Yeah, um, but I I because I was surprised how much I like this movie. I it really did shock Russell's me. Just gonna um, pick straight yeah. up hard. Like softcore porn. Well, circa, well, circa, well, circa two well, thousand two. Red well, shoe diaries. Well, <laughs> showgirls, well, strip tease, starting well, to be more. Are you familiar wild with Two Bone Junction? Maybe. Some wild things in there. Yeah, yeah Blue Lagoon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, good movie. It's a simple concept. You know, for a simple concept that works, it's immediately grabbable. The stakes are clear. You could fill in anything to do this, and the way that they did this would make this bleak not particularly inspiring, almost uh, overtly cynical and making exterior forces that were going to get in their way to be almost mysterious and surprising um, was ambitious. I think that's, that's remarkably ambitious to do. And I thought it was clearly the shoot was ambitious and, um, for it not being particularly uh, <laughs> uplifting or inspiring, it is nonetheless thrilling to watch. If, if you haven't seen this movie, uh, I, and I will have to buckle up and actually watch the Wages of Fear uh, movie, the original, because like I, I do think, I'm very curious of how that's going to translate, because I really did think that this movie, uh, quite frankly, fucking rocked. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's my final thoughts. Uh, shall I... Uh, I'll go next sure. uh, and let Chris wrap up with his own pick. Uh, yeah, I actually enjoyed this quite a lot. I thought that uh, tonally and thematically it was quite strong. Uh, I liked the way it was structured. Um, like, obviously, the big set piece when you, like, describe the movie is like, oh, they have to travel through these difficult areas with this truck full of nitroglycerin. But I think it's smart that that's not as much of the movie as you think it's going to be going in. I think it's really great that um, they take the time to really set up this backstory and set up the degree of poverty and hellaciousness they go through in this town in the middle of nowhere that they've been banished to. Like, like they've been, you know, sent to the pits of hell almost for their like crimes and their sins. Um, and like they have to do this Herculean task to get out. I, I, I and, uh, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of really subtle storytelling, visual stuff that scene I talked about, like in a microcosm with the clearing of the tree. Like, yeah, I think it's, uh, quite solid. I think it, I, I, I saw some people think some people are critical of this film. And then there's also people who think this is like an overlooked masterpiece. I think it might be an overlooked masterpiece. I think it's a really I, good movie. I mean, like, it's certainly better than The Exorcist, in my opinion. I think it's better than French Connection. I think it's his best yeah. film that I've seen so far. Yeah, you don't have to believe in God to enjoy this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, I loved this one when I was younger, and I still love it. Um, the uh, Just the sheer level of nihilism and intensity in this film uh, was sort of paradoxically refreshing in Indiana at the time because I didn't like I saw this in the 90s. So there wasn't anything this grim and dark that was available to me casually. Uh, So finding it at the library did feel like I had um, gone to the adult section or I had somehow Ah. found one they accidentally left on the shelf. I really love the fact that all the characters are grounded. Um, I think it was valuable that they did that that long opening because, you know, it it sort of has that problem that like slasher films have or any films with like like the Dirty Dozen even and things like that, where you have so many characters introduced. It's very hard to really connect with all those characters unless you have meaningful moments. 
This mm-hmm. one thankfully starts off with the meaningful moments and you get to know them as it's going into it. Um, it's hard for me to like compare this one to the other film because it is essentially two different, very different perspectives telling the same story. So it's kind of wonderful to be able to do that sort of a comparison without saying that it's exactly the same intention for both of them. Um, I uh, The big thing in this one that I like is something that I've seen a bunch of times with films like this, even the movie Tremors, for example. It's problem solving. Like they run into a problem and it's not some big over the top thing from outside the film that you've never fucking seen before. It's, you know, they've got nitroglycerin. Let's blow up the tree. It's we've got to get her off this bridge. Let's use the winch. It's stuff like that. That's like very uh, tactile and down to earth, you know, you got a problem, you fix the problem. And it's the sort of problem solving that I could imagine myself doing or someone in like a blue collar desperate situation. Um, I just loved it. I still love it. So thank you for enjoying it, guys. Yeah, I, no, was, that rocked. Can yeah. I, can I uh, circle back to influences again? And again, this is kind of a Tarantino thing, but I, I think it's accurate. The thing with the prologues is, I think that's also very much a Tarantino thing. The way he would do it, of course, is to jump immediately to like the village and then cut to a certain frame of like each of the individual people. And then like mm-hmm. a title card would come up being like Victor. And then he'd For have sure. the little prologue sequence. Well, there yeah. was, but I think there it's was still a, present. The European version got re-edited without uh, William Friedkin's feedback so that it did exactly what you're saying, where it started at the village and then did flashbacks that were mixed within the film to introduce what the characters are from. I don't know this if that's film was cut film and recut a couple of times in its release. Yeah. And, you know, now I think we, the, the definitive version is out now. And I think that's the one that everybody that everybody watches. But yeah, yeah. no, I, I yeah. and 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 it's it, I, I, I like because it's again, I think it's it, it's like a novel and the way they cut it. It's like a novel. Like here's chapter one, chapter two. I, I kind of dig it. And yeah, most certainly Tarantino does that kind of shit all the time. And I think he yeah. would have done it like that. And it probably would have worked. Tarantino's fine. Yeah, um, I'm sure okay. it would have worked in this movie, too, to do it. Like that other cut you talk about, I'm sure that still works. Like, if yeah. you wait until you get to, like, Victor looking at that weird cat poster, and then you're like, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Friedkin just hated it, but Friedkin thought a lot about his own vision, um, which is fine. Uh, and again, I think if this I, this is his best film, because, oh, good job. Uh, it's a shame that it almost it pretty much ended him, but... Uh, uh, you know, Star Wars ate Michael, its lunch. Hey, you know, look, what are you gonna look do? at uh, Heaven's Gate. Star Wars and, yeah. ate a lot of lunches over the years. Yeah, yeah, it sure did. Okay, so now I'm up. So I was thinking a lot about this theme, and I've had to pool a couple people who I knew, like, you know, my wife. And luckily, we just, Zach and I just got done with a wedding, who I got to meet a lot of old friends from high school, and I kind of pooled them as much as I could. Um, you know, if I'm honest with myself, I'd, I'd choose uh, Lock, Sock, and Two Smoking Barrels, but that is too close to Reservoir Dogs but because it, it, it's basically the British Reservoir Dogs, so I'm not going to put us through that. Uh, and if I'm being really honest with myself, my favorite movie when I was a kid is my favorite movie today, which is uh, The Hustler. But I feel like that's a little against uh, the spirit of the theme. So I am going to choose not a porno, but <laughs> I have to choose... <laughs> I have to choose the movie that I dressed up for in my freshman year in high school. And that is Alex from A Clockwork Orange. We are going to do Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork, Clockwork Orange. Orange. Buckle okay. up, bye everybody. So not uh, not a porno. Uh, <laughs> well, I, mean, I do think there is, there is, there is um, some kind of, thematic through lines between these yeah two and yeah. It, yeah i mean it or at is... least at the very least reservoir dogs has dna of both of the things that follow yeah, inside sure, of it or sure it's it's youth, not... youth violence i think is the big thing in clockwork orange because it's supposed to, they're all supposed to be roughly high school age in that movie i think or think late so. or early 20s so yeah it's i could been definitely a long time since i've read the be, book it'll, so. it'll be interesting yeah. I, I don't think i've seen this movie since high school either um, uh, yeah, I don't think it, I've seen it in 15 years. Yeah, hmm. so I, I, it's wow. been a minute since I've seen it too, and and I, I I sort of know what we're getting into. And for that, dear viewer, I apologize. This will be um, this will be one that I will watch uh, without Shannon. Uh, yeah, well, Sarah is probably not all that interested in it, even though she's seen it before. But you know, it's not. It's a anyway. But well, I, like I said, in the spirit of, of the theme, my wife's. I'm, 
it's one of my wife's favorite films from back in the day. So yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, but in the spirit of what we were kind of talking about with the beginning of the steam, you know, it's movies that you liked in high school hey. that maybe you're like, well, it's a phase you kind of grow out of, you know. Hey man, uh, the Droogs were in Space Jam: A New Legacy. It's coming back. It's topical. Yeah. yeah. So is everything else that Warner Brothers owns was in yeah, that movie. Um, yeah. I think it's good we're going to watch this one because I think we talked about this one briefly in another episode during uh, Doctor Strange the violence. We talked about yes. Strange Love. We talked about it with Strange Love. Sir Second bit. Kubrick. Yeah. Well, I think it was. Uh, but even, but even the... Wild Bunch. I think it was during the Peck and Pop yeah. episodes. We we brought up Kubrick quite a bit, um, and Clockwork Orange as far as like visceral violence, almost for violence's sake. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, awesome. so for that, uh, you know, I, I don't think. But before we go, let me give a quick rundown of the points. Uh, so, Chris Borf, you have no more bonus points to give out, but you have a whopping 14 points to give out in final voting. Um, I have one more oh. point to give out with 11 points to vote. And uh, Zach Powers, you have one more bonus point to give out with 12 points at final vote. So okay. we will see how that breaks down at the end of uh, Clark Rick Orange, and then we will go on to a new theme. But spoiler alert you will find out later what will happen uh, after this particular theme uh long time listeners will know if you're looking at or your could calendar. guess at the very least yeah you could be looking <laughs> at your calendar and make a pretty good guess of what's about to happen um mm -hmm. so i guess on that note uh thank you very much because this was a fun movie to watch and, and yeah, ingest and and really yeah. kind of talk about because yeah I, I if you haven't seen it i recommend it audience um, so on that note uh yeah uh, it's been great. We'll see you next time for A Clockwork Orange. I've been Russell Carlson, and with my co-host, Chris Borup. Don't touch the truck. <laughs> and with my other co-host, Zach Powers. It's five minutes till nine in France. <laughs> oh, kaboom. <laughs> <laughs> and for one more kaboom for you, as we always say here on The Movie Trap, Diane Ladd is too young to be Chevy Chase's mom. Well, that is the movie trap, promise. We say it all the time. See ya, folks. <laughs> this is a telex from home responding to my report. First part is concerned, regret, loss of life, etc., etc., injuries, and so on. Limitations on production in recent months due to acts of terrorism and political uncertainties emphasize attention, immediate supply obligation. Minimum concern, R&D. What the hell is R&D? Research and development. Please advise cause of action soonest. Signed, Weber. Is that it? Yes. What are the immediate supply obligations? One tanker, 160,000 barrels by the end of next month. They'll have to delay it. And Charter's running. If we have to take a loss that big, we might as well shut down now and save expenses.